be seated. Wow, I have been God. So we pour out our praise. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Last verse, last song, Psalm 150. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Grab a Bible. We're going to be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, if you need a Bible, uh, Bob, stand in the back. You just slip your hand up. Keep it up. We'll make sure that you get one this morning if you'd like one in hand. And uh, we uh, probably feels like the expectation is to put a Bible in hand. And so maybe you have your phone app. Uh, I heard the other day there's like 80,000 downloads of U version in a day or a week or something like that. That's incredible. So like last week we were talking about being connected. That means a lot of people are getting connected with the Word of God. That's, that's good. That's cool. And uh, so open up. If you've got your handheld device, you're out there on Facebook Live, grab a Bible somewhere. And, uh, and uh, open up 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll get there in just a moment. Um, if you need to, I, mean, I think I mentioned earlier, but there's an electronic sermon outline. Well, fill in the spaces on uh, our app. And we have paper here if you want to take notes. But uh, last week we started talking about connections. Um, I mentioned that we're the most connected, disconnected generation ever. Um, connected, right, electronically. Uh, that I you know, mentioned that about version, which is a Bible app. You know, that number of people, it's kind of staggering the amount of people who are getting connected just to the Bible. We're, we're connected through social media. Um, I'm thankful for it. Um, we've got a lot of great connections this morning with the, the different people that are on Facebook Live participating in the service and stuff. And uh, so electronically, we're connected technologically. But last week, we started contemplating the fact that we're, we're also experiencing symptoms of being the most disconnected generation ever in, uh, in loneliness and feeling like our relationships are superficial and then actually being superficial in a lot of ways. So we're the most connected, disconnected generation ever. You were made for relationships. This is where for the follower of Christ, for a Christian, the uh, rub, if you will, comes in. You were made for relationships. And I, look, I get at some of our personalities here this morning. That's one of the last things we want to hear. I understand that. Maybe you're an introvert. Maybe and you're looking at personality. Trying to get beyond that. It's, in a lot of ways, this doesn't have anything to do with personality. It's just... The, the Word of God. Matter of fact, last week we went to Genesis 2.18, right? Genesis 2, verse 18. This is uh, Eve, right? Eve's being taken out of Adam, and God said, it is not good, Genesis 2.18, for the man, the word in Hebrew is Adam, meaning humankind, the man, to be alone. I don't, I don't have any problem with a personal interpretation application saying to men and women here this morning, you were created to not be alone and to be in relationships with God and with one another. You were created for relationships. You might consider yourself a loner, that's good. I've got friends and loved ones and people. I have a side of me that likes to be alone every once in a while, but you were created for relationships. We went to Romans chapter 12 last week. The Apostle Paul here and in 1 Corinthians, I'll make that connection in a moment. But uh, Paul is saying to the church in Rome in chapter 12, verse 5, he says, So in Christ, though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Sometimes I'll have you repeat stuff. I just do that because it's helpful for me when I repeat uh, things. Sometimes I'm running risk of remembering it, you know what I mean? Because there's that, they say, you're going to forget 80% of everything I say this morning, but if you repeat it, we might remember it. And that when I first read that uh, verse in uh, the NIV, it, uh, the, the good thing to repeat there is look at somebody else and say, hey, I belong to you or you belong to me, right? When the actual uh, word in Greek, Greek in this, this text here, really has the idea of being connected to one another. So that's why I have God's word translation up there. It says, in the same way, even though we are many individuals, Christ makes us one body and individuals who are connected to each other. Look at somebody else and say, I'm connected to you. <laughs> yeah, it's just the word of God, right? I'm connected to you. And, uh, and last week, we, uh, we dealt with that. You're a child of God if you've 
if you've accepted Christ as a as Savior of your life, and you were created to be connected. We, we dealt with the question, why did God create us? I talked a little bit about uh, uh, many years ago, I used to build things, create things with my hands. The pleasure and joy that I got out of that just because I could, and how uh, the scriptures tells us that God created for his pleasure in the creation account. Many of you are aware that God looked at it right when he created Everything but man, he said it's good. When he created man, he said it's very good. God created for his pleasure, and we were created. But we were created to be connected, and in two ways in particular. One, you were created to be connected to God. Um, you were created for a vertical relationship with God. Once again, we dealt with this a little bit last week, or actually this is the big, biggest part of what we dealt with. You were created to be connected to God. And look, there's a lot more biblical support that I'm giving you. And there's so much of this. that so many times I'm preaching a message and I'm thinking of the greatest commandment, right? Jesus was asked, right? He said the greatest commandment was to love God, right? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That was the, the number one, the greatest commandment, right? That's the connection to God. You're created to, get, like, uh, to, to be in relationship to God. And then secondly, you are to love your neighbor, right? As what? As yourself, right? That's the second thing. That's to be connected to one another. And so even the, the, uh, the, the greatest commandment points in this direction. So we were created to be connected to God and in relationship. Last week we dealt with that Satan tries to isolate us from God and from others. It's in that isolation, and you can, once again, you can read. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of opinion that we're one of the most isolated generations ever while we're the most connected. And it's in that isolation that Satan wants to defeat us and to discourage us. So the point last week was a healthy life starts with being connected to God. Gave the invitation. Some people responded. You're feeling isolated to make sure and to be in that connection with God. So I rejoice with those of you who made that decision last week to just have the courage to say, hey, I feel isolated and I'm not going to let Satan beat me up in this way. So, uh, so this week we want to deal with the fact that you are to be connected to others. You're in the body, the body of Christ. You were created to be connected to, to each other. And this is where another rub comes in. And I realized that. I said, uh, it, it, I was thinking in the first service that when I, um, I'll get to places like this in the message where I'm thinking, this is like 100% my opinion. I didn't go find numbers to back this up. I like it when I do that because then I can say, here, I have my proof, right? We like to prove stuff, right? But then there's places where, hey, just experience tells me, here's what I think about it, right? And when I say the rub comes in, what I, need, what I mean is, in my experience, most people are okay with God. It's just other people they have a problem with. <laughs> right? God is perfect. He's good. He's loving. He's got all that stuff, right? It's, it's each other that we have a, that where we get into problems, Right? And so it got me to thinking, this is still experience over the years of, of ministry. When we come to God, we come to church. I'm thinking about that first time maybe that, uh, that somebody does that. Um, I think one of the last things we're thinking um, is that we're about to enter into relationships with other church people. And so I ran through in my mind, I was like, okay, when people make that decision... Um, and for whatever reason, maybe, maybe you grew up in the church and you needed a reset, you come back into a relationship with God, or maybe you never had that, you came into a relationship with God, and you decide, i got to go to church, I need to do that. Or maybe you decided to go to church first, you, you knew something needed to happen between you and God, and you decided to go to church. So I think what people at that spot in life are thinking about is mostly improving their own lives, fixing up the stuff they've messed up, Pleasing God, right? I think when most of us made that decision, hey, I'm going to go to church. I think I, a lot of what we're thinking, I need to, I, I got to get some things fixed up. I'm not saying everybody. I'm not, I don't want to generalize in that way. 
maybe for all the right reasons, right? You, you did. Or like I said, there's some people I don't even think, think about it. Maybe you grew up going to church, right? And, and uh, maybe got away and you're like, I need to go back. And you're, you're just thinking about the fact that you know it's important to do. So here's the, what's interesting to me is that in that, if I'm right about them, the, la uh, uh, that, then the last thing on our mind is actually one of the first things that is actually happening and taking place. And what I mean is building relationships. We need each other. I need you. We need each other. I need you. You need each other. If you're a Christian, you're connected. God has called you not just to believe, but to belong. You need the church. You need the church. I, uh, I was talking to one of the staff. I, I'm not going to use names, but because uh, I won't put them in the spot. I was, talk, I was working through this this week, and I said, hey, I want you to do something. I want you to create a banner, a big sign for me, and put it on the door this week for emphasis. You guys know I like to use objects and stuff for the messages. On the front door, that as people come in, big, big letters, it says, relationships upon entering here. And the, re yeah, the reaction was about like that, and I ain't doing that. <laughs> I'm not doing that because uh, she was thinking what I was thinking. If we did that, there'd probably be a lot of people like, well, I'm not going here. Is that what they think happens in there? <laughs> I, you know, and I, it could be a whole other message, the reason why we're at that point. For some, it's just my busyness. I don't have time for another relationship. I'm busy. Uh, matter of fact, they, they say the average size in America is set the church size is 70 to 100. The reason why is that's all one person can build in relationships and maintain. And so we, we look at the... the I, I just think the last thing we're thinking is that we're, we're there to build relationships, right? <laughs> but here I've just said that's one of the things, it's one of the first things actually that's, that's happening. Uh, I want to make a connection here real quick because I've been using terms and words and I want, them to, I want us to understand because I've been throwing that word church around as well. I told you 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and we're going there. Some of you are thinking, we ever going to get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right? This is expanded from Romans. As a matter of fact, some of you are going to... You're going to think, this, this sounds just like Romans. Um, it is in a lot of ways. Romans chapter 12 that we talked about last week that I read for you last week. You come over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read the text in verse 12. And you're going to be like, this is pretty much the same stuff. Same author, writer, the Apostle Paul, right? Writing both to the church in Rome, the church in uh, Corinth. The reason I'm choosing this text today pretty much says the same thing. Is it's expanded. It really expands. Paul's dealing with issues in the church in Corinth, right? He's writing them a letter. That's what this is about their church and things they need to deal with. And this church had a ton of issues, a whole bunch of issues. As a matter of fact, depending on the translation you have, mine does have this. But uh, you're open to 1 Corinthians 12. You guys with the app, I don't know what you're going to do there. Maybe you can just flip pages like that. Mine, you can actually do that, I think. But if you go back to chapter 1, you begin to look, and your translation has topical divisions within the chapter, subtopics, right? You can begin to look and see what some of the issues were, because right away, chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 1, divisions in the church is one of the first things I see, right? Um, uh, he deals with it again in chapter 3, divisions in the church. Chapter 5, an immoral brother, and, the, and what it meant to expel the immoral brother. Lawsuits among believers, chapter 6. Law. As a matter of fact, over my years of ministry, I've gone to that one quite a bit. People come, church people, and uh, brothers, sisters in Christ are mad at each other, and they got something going on in business, and they, do, I, do I sue them? And I, I think I've heard the Bible says I shouldn't sue my brother. That's actually what it says. So you need to read that. In chapter 6, lawsuits among believers. Sexual immorality deals with the issue of marriage, food sacrifice to idols. And once again, you can read all that. I love Paul's account here of the Lord's Supper. But one of the reasons it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and you can read it, is he's dealing with issues, problems in the church. There were divisions. They were sinning in the way they took the Lord's Supper, the things they were doing there. So then over in chapter 12, he deals with spiritual gifts. They also were having problems here. They were jealous of each other, their talents, their gifts, and everything else. They were debating and fighting about the gift of tongues. I won't go into the whole deal there, but uh, so Paul's addressing it. And we come into these verses in chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, and here's what Paul says to him. Let me read it for you. 
I'm not, I'm not going to read every, I'm, as a matter of fact, after uh, beginning verse 15, I'm going to skip a little bit here, but beginning verse 12. The body is a unit, though it is all made up of many parts, and though all the parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit and one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Okay, and Paul is saying, um, I, I thought about this. I think one way to explain this is, all of you in here this morning, the first service, the services we've had today, the kids out there, we're all different people. Do, do you know that, right? We have different backgrounds. We grew up in different places, in different ways, different experiences, different personalities. Some of you are introverted. Some of you are extroverted. We're all different. But we're all a part of Friendship Blessing Church. Um, if you consider this your church home, you know, maybe you don't today or whatever right now, but if you consider this part of your church home, and even today in here, you're part of Friendship Blessing Church. Pastors and I in the community will talk about each other's pastors. We kind of know the personality of each church is right, what they are. We'll talk about that church. We're talking about you if they're talking about here, because you're a part of the whole. You're one. But you're different than everybody else in that church, and God uses that. For good. These people uh, in the church in Corinth were having a problem with that. <laughs> is what, and so Paul goes on to, as a matter of fact, I'm not going to read from verse 15 down, but what I call it is they were having jealousy with each other over who was playing what part. So, so Paul says you're part of the body. The foot can't say to the hand, you don't belong because you're the hand. So you can't do that. You need the foot and the hand both. If you're missing either of them, you know that, <laughs> you know, physically. Then down in verse 21, it says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and given greater honor to the parts that lack it. So that there should be no division in the body. See there, that's what he's dealing with. Because they've got problems with each other. Their jealousy over the gifts, the talents that each of them had were using in the body. And then they were looking at each other. I don't like him. I don't like her. They're not playing their part good enough. They have none. And then this, that, and the other, whatever. You know, we and Paul saying, stop that stuff. You all belong to the body and there shouldn't be any divisions among you. That's what he said. Where was I? Um... Verse 25, there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. You might not even, some of you this morning, you don't even know each other. And, and maybe I don't even know you this morning. If you're suffering this week, according to the scriptures, we're suffering with you. I'd like to know what's going on and be able to do that with you, but we're suffering together. If something good has happened in your life, um, I've had good things happen in my life in recent days, finishing different things that I'd accomplished, stuff everybody rejoiced with me. And, and, and that's what Paul's saying. You should be together in, in, uh, in suffering and, uh, and rejoice together. Then in verse 27, I threw this up on the screen for you because it's the last week was Romans 12, 5, right? Verse 27 and 8, I did something with them because it's kind of, this is really our key verse here this week. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. It's like Romans 12 last week, right? The body of Christ and you're a part of it. And then he says, and God has placed you in the church and he, or uh, God has placed in the church and he begins to list the gifts and talents. So he's, he's talking about the church. So this, what I wanted to make sure we understand is what we're talking about when we say you're a part of the body. And then over here in verse 28, he uses the word church. And I thought of Paul in, uh, in Ephesians chapter up. Uh, well, actually, I, I, I wanted you to see the word here. The word body is soma in Greek, right? Um, it's the word soma, which, which is a body flesh, which is the way you could, if you like totally took this literally, because Paul's trying to make a metaphor, like I said about our church a few moments ago. You can see down here, it says some of the physical body. It can mean that, but it's also used figuratively of the mystical body of Christ or the church, the one people of God. So when we say body, we're talking about the church. 
The problem with the way we use church, the way we think of it, we say church, we think of a building in a place, right? Even when I talk to other pastors in community, that's really in a lot of ways what we're thinking if I talk about one of the churches, because that's the way we think. But in the scripture, in particular the New Testament, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think the word church as a building, building is much used in the New Testament. Most of it's this word. This is Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, 22 to 23. He says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head. That's Jesus, okay? So we got this body, and Jesus is the head, right? Over everything for the church. Ecclesia. I've talked about this before. Ecclesia means the people. When this stuff was written, they didn't actually have church buildings. They didn't have a building. They met each other's home, stuff like that. And they really could see and know that it was about the people they were talking about when they said church. We often refer to it as the universal church. And I don't mean that church that calls itself the universal church. I'm talking about all those who are actually in God through his son, Jesus Christ. Which at Friendship Wesleyan, we believe that's all kinds of people, not just Wesleyans. And so what that means is this building, this land is a beautiful place. And I'm thank thankful for the history and what God's given to us. It's a tool for ministry. But the body of Christ, the ecclesia, is the ministry. If there was no ecclesia, this building wouldn't, it wouldn't matter at all except to somebody else for the value of it monetarily, right? That's all it would matter. But the body of Christ is, uh, is what we're talking about with the, uh, with the church. And, uh, and so uh, Paul's, you know, Paul's dealing with the uh, problems in this uh, Corinthian church when he deals with this. And it made me think something, because we're talking about, and I'm saying, hey, you need the church, right? And, uh, and it, it raised a question for me. Like, why? If I were you, I'd be asking why. Why do I need the church? What are the benefits? And here are some considerations real quick for you, okay? Because I actually, and some of you can probably sum this up to, he just been in the church so long, he doesn't know any different. If anybody knows the bad or good about church life, it's a pastor. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> and I'm saying that for other pastors, not me. And I want you to know that after 30 years of ministry in the ecclesia, meeting in buildings, there is no better place to learn about real life and to do real life than in the, the church, the body of Christ. I, I just, I totally believe that. That's why I love to be here Sunday morning and, and love to be together with you. Um, but here's the considerations. Here's the first thing. I don't remember where I heard this. I'd love to give credit somewhere else because I heard it somewhere else. But here's the deal. The, 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 the church family is the only relationships that are going to last forever. And what I mean by that, I don't mean to send anybody away depressed this morning. According to the Bible and to scriptures, when we think about the end of days, the culmination of the ages, the end times, and God's going to bring all this to conclusion and the judgment and everything else, relationships are going to change. Your job career relationships, well, they will not exist anymore. As a matter of fact, family-wise, there's relationships that will not exist anymore. The Bible says that in heaven there won't be marriage. It won't be giving and taking in marriage. Relationships are going to change. The one thing we know for certain that will not change is those who are in Christ Jesus. Those relationships are eternal. Those relationships are forever. That's it made me think in the first service. This is why it's so important why our family and friends and loved ones, we would want them to experience the incredible thing we do here in being together in the body of Christ. Um, so that eternity is that for them along with us. And so the, those relationships, the, the, they're the only relationships that are going to last forever. In the body of Christ, you become more like Jesus. And here was my thought here. To, uh, Friendship Blessing Church, we talk about transformed lives, powerful people. I'm telling you, I, there's great stuff out there. There's great books. There's great places you can learn great stuff. I look and I read, uh, you know, everything I can to learn more about great stuff. 
But there is no better place to really be transformed and to change than in the ecclesia, the body of Christ. And here's the deal. You just don't do a good job on your own. It's made me think over the years, and look, I get this, I understand. People over the years have said to me, hey, I don't need church to worship. That's true. Matter of fact, the scripture says, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. So whatever you're doing, I hope you're worshiping when you're out there. That, that, that's my thinking there. As a matter of fact, one of the cool things about being in ministry over the years, so a, average day of a pastor like three, three and a half, four years, I don't know what of those numbers are right. I just know I've been around longer than that. I've known some of these kids around Friendship Bus St. Church that are now adults since they were kids, you know what I mean? And I've seen marriages and relationships and people transformed over the years. One of the neatest things is to look at all those years and to see the lives I know outside the church would have not looked like they do today. <laughs> and I'm telling you, many of us here, it would not have been good. <laughs> it's a journey. I know sometimes we see God coming in our life and all of a sudden one day it's all fixed, the next day I got it all. A whole bunch of this stuff is a journey through life, right? A whole bunch of this stuff is a journey through life. And in the body of Christ, we, we, we do that together, and we learn from each other, and we challenge each other. It doesn't always go exactly right, right? Because, I, well, I'll get to that in a moment. But here's the deal. The writer of Hebrews, chapter 10, 24, 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Say so that relationship, how we're connected together. We grow each other. We encourage each other. We, we spur one another on toward love and good deeds. We do that in the body of Christ. You know, and I, I made this statement. I'm going to make it again. The greatest truths of life are learned right here in the body of Christ. And some of you should immediately be thinking when I say that. If that's true, then why isn't the whole world in church? Because I'm saying church is the best place to learn about true life and real life. So why isn't everybody, you know, why isn't, and here's the deal, I think. Um, and this is just my opinion, right? Because learning real life, it isn't easy, and it's often not very comfortable. It's, it's often not easy, and it's often not comfortable. As a matter of fact, probably the greatest teacher about real life was Jesus, right? Right? If anybody spoke and spoke about the truth of life, actually Jesus described it, giving the truth in love. If anybody did that, it was Jesus, right? And yet, how many people rejected what he said, and in the end of his physical life here, right? It looked like there was little to show for it. So many people have rejected it. Why? Because Jesus made it clear. What I say is not easy for most people to accept. Real life is, is kind of hard. That's why I say, I say a little bit later, I think that, that there's quite a number of people who go from relationship to relationship, from church to church, from issue to issue, to problem to problem. And there's a time for all those things to change and to change. And I'm not saying you never do. I'm just saying that there's a stick to it that we do where we learn life together, and it's the greatest place to really learn the truths of life. Um, as a matter of fact, it, uh, it, uh, it made me think one of the things that we learn together that really people need to learn. And I, you've probably said or heard somebody say, um, I don't like conflict. Right? As a matter of fact, this is the ironic thing. I've, I've gotten to know a lot of people in ministry and life, and I've watched those people that when you, and maybe you're one of these people, you don't know, because these people don't realize it, right? Maybe I don't realize it, because nobody said to me, but it just seems like they love conflict. They're in one conflict after the other. Most of those people, if you ask them, or you listen, they'll somewhere along the way say, oh, I hate conflict. And, and you're like, oh, boy, they're always in a conflict. They look like they love it, you know? 
And it's, the bottom line is 99.9% .9 of us said, I don't like conflict. But here's the deal is, is conflict is for some of us a daily <coughs> thing. It's kind of, there's conflict in life. And what I've learned about the body of Christ is, is it's a great place to learn about conflict. And the church in Corinth was going through all kinds of conflict, right? Matter of fact, here in 1 Corinthians, it's chapter 1 of the same book of the Bible, letter, right? Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. And the reason he's saying that is because they were. They were divided over multiple things. When we went over the topics, we were talking about some of that. I've got a lot of stories of conflict in the church. It's just kind of a part of my job. When you talk a lot and you're involved in other people's lives a lot, conflict's just... And I don't mean conflict like a big a fight that you have. Conflict can just be misunderstandings in relationships, right? And they happen. And most of us are not really good at it, even, even in the church, because we, we don't stick, we work it out. Well, so I got a lot of stories I can tell you, but I remember one in particular at our first church. I was a young pastor. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's people who complain a lot, right? Um, like I said, maybe I'm one, I don't know, maybe you're one of those people. It's all about self-aware. Well, I've learned something about people who complain a lot. Actually, if you've got somebody in your life that way, they're more helpful than you think. People who complain a lot walk in a room, and actually what they're doing is they're seeing everything that's wrong. And they're right about a lot of it. So you've got to learn to listen. And they just don't realize that what you're inter interpreting is they complain about everything. Most of them are, are uh, some of them are people who are really not that involved, just love to complain, and those people bother me the most. But there's a lot of complainers. If you're a complainer, you might be one of these. Very helpful and very involved, right? And, and I love them the most because I can learn from them. We can work on a relationship. But I was young. There was this lady in the church. She complained about everything. But she was involved. And it's hard to explain this, but a loving and kind lady, but man, she complained about everything. It's like, every day, it's like, hey, pastor, we need to fix this. Hey, pastor, you wouldn't believe, hey, pastor. And, you know, she walked into her, pastor this, pastor that, or in meetings, out here in meetings. Pastor, she just complains about everything. I'm just listen to her. Maybe she's got something to offer. One Sunday morning, just moments before I was to get up and preach at the beginning of service, I was in the back, long sanctuary, I was in the back. She walks up to me. And she goes, Pastor, I need to talk to you for a second. And I'm thinking, oh, 30 seconds before the sermon? Not today. This is not going to happen. So I got my courage up, and I looked at her, and I said, you know something? You complain all the time, but just about everything. And I don't know what you've got today, but I want you to know that just seconds before I get up and preach, you are not going to complain to me this morning. I want you to think about what you're ready to, what you think you're going to say to me, because I'm going to let you say it. And I really want you to think about the fact that you need to stop all this complaining. And especially not to pass a few moments before service. We can talk later or something. So say what you're going to say or be quiet. I was pretty upset. She had a daughter, right? And she, her eyes were about this big. <laughs> her mouth had hit the floor and she goes, your Girl Scout cookies are in. <laughs> uh, I was worried about her ruining the sermon and everything. I had just ruined the whole service for myself, right? It's like, like a day or two later, she calls up. Pastor, been thinking about what you said. I said, me too. We went up and talked. She said, you're right, and I needed to hear it. Nobody's ever told me. I'm sorry, I love our church. I said, no, I said, you, 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 you see stuff that needs to be done, and I appreciate that. I don't want you to cut off your complaint, and I should have reacted that way, I apologize. But see, that stuff only happens when you're doing life together, right? And you're working through life together. We, we had a fantastic relationship after that. She complained a lot still. <laughs> but we understood where we came from. It's in the body of Christ, right? Real quick, just thoughts to wrap it up. In the body of Christ, you have your emotional needs met. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Many people, I said this, deal with life by going from relationship to relationship, church to church, sometimes job to job because of this reason. And I'm not saying there's not a reason. And good reasons, maybe. But I'm saying it happens. They never stay long enough to deal with life. Life is me messy, folks, right? 
There is no perfect relationships. There's no perfect marriages. There's no perfect parents. There's no perfect churches, and there are no perfect people. Some people point at the church for not being perfect and saying that's proof that God doesn't exist. If you read the Word of God, you'll find out the proof He does. That's why we needed Jesus. I'm going to tell you, by the way, all the proofs that people have that God doesn't exist are actually all the proofs for why He does. People will say the Bible was written by men. That's proof that it's not the Word of God. If you do your study, you'll find out it's proof that it is. And the church not being perfect is actually proof that God exists and that the story of the Bible for salvation through Jesus Christ is what's real. In the body of Christ, you learn your gifts and talents. Ecclesiastes tells us two are better than one. And finally, this is really cool. You could have come up with your own, but the body of Christ helps you to meet your need for love, right? We need love. You might not admit that, but we do. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. One of the things I love around here, in the first service, I was like, do I say this or not? And ladies, I hope you're doing this. I don't know. One of the cool things for me at Friendship on St. Church, a whole bunch of the men around here. And uh, if, you're, if you're a man with us this morning, you kind of knew this, you didn't know this, don't let this freak you out. And, and you don't have to be a part of the club. They, they, they mean this intentionally to each other. But they've been doing life together. The men at Friendship Blessing Church tell each other they love each other a bunch. It's really cool. I've been on the phone multiple times a day. And that man I'm talking with, before I get off, says, Pastor, I love you. I'm like, that's awesome. And I'll hear them say it to each other. And uh, the, there's just something profound to me that men in the body of Christ are growing and transforming over a long journey together where they've grown and where they want to say that. And it, the body of Christ. So what's the point here? <clears throat> I think your life is better when you recognize that you were created to be connected to the body of Christ. Everybody was created to be connected to God. You were created to be connected to the body of Christ. <clears throat> you need to be connected to each other. Some of you are thinking, i got enough connections. This is the last thing I need to hear. I understand that. And maybe you are connected. But by and large, truth of the matter is, is even in the church, we're not connected to the body of Christ the way we ought to be. So this message is to throw something out to you. As a matter of fact, if you want it this morning, you don't have to take it. Everybody's going to get a little gift. Just a little white Lego. It says Romans chapter 12, verse 5. I put a Lego wall up there, a little screen for you. Romans chapter 12, verse 5. It's just a reminder. As a matter of fact, before service, I was handing some out and just saying, hey, this is to remind you to make sure you're connected to God. You need to be connected to God through Christ. And then, don't forget, you're connected to each other. And then I would say, brother or sister, right? We don't say that. Like some churches, they say that to everybody. But I'll say it every once in a while to remind you that you're connected to each other. You might not even like me today. If you're, if you're a believer in Christ, we're connected. You're my sister or you're my brother in Christ. So it's just a little reminder. And I'm challenging the church between now and October 1st. The leadership is going to help me. We're going to look around the church and we're going to say, how can we make sure that all of us are connected? Because we live in an isolated generation. One of the things we want to make sure it happens is we're connected. Connected to God first, but then connected to each other. I don't know exactly what all that's going to mean. It might mean somebody getting involved in a small group Wednesday night or getting involved with each other in some way. Maybe even the day before you leave, you're thinking, I need to know somebody. Friendship Wesley in church. I haven't really done that. I know of them, but I don't really know anybody. I'm kind of busy. Step out and take that. Because by October 1st, we're going to pre pre uh, present for you opportunities to do that. And I want you praying about it and thinking about it now. Because connected in Christ, we're, we're stronger. And in this generation, we need to be. Romans 12, 5, in God's Word translation, in the same way, even though we are many individuals, Christ makes us one body and individuals, we are connected to each other. Will you stand with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that your longing and desire, the whole of your Word, is that you wanted to be connected to us. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when we were unworthy, no good, your longing and desire was to be connected to us. Provide us a way that we could come boldly this morning before the throne of grace and mercy. Thank you, Father. It's hard for us to accept, though, that we're connected to each other. We're a busy generation. We've got a lot on our schedules. 
But Father, we realize we're out there drifting along. We might even think we got a bunch of connections, but they're superficial and not really connected to you. Father, we don't want anybody in our family to be isolated and uh, under attack from the evil one. So give us guidance, and direction, wisdom. Father, make us salt and light as we go from this place that this community and world would know the incredible hope we've experienced in this place this morning because of your word and because of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Bob's handing these out. There's a basket over there. You can grab one on before you go out. Just a reminder.